so um, this project really had its genesis when we started uh, talking with farmers after um, just a really terrible year of flooding and, um, and started talking about the likelihood of, um, of increased frequency of extreme weather events in the future and how that was going to impact um, especially horticultural crops, which both of us um, work with farmers who grow uh, mostly vegetable crops. Um, and so through the discussions that we had, um, we, we developed a plan to work together with farmers and um, were able to get funding from SARE, North Central SARE for a three-year project. And just to give you a quick overview of that, the core of that project is a community of practice where we are bringing together farmers who are either practicing reduced tillage or who are interested in trying reduced tillage. And um, especially in the, in the winter months, uh, we are meeting together regularly to discuss what people are doing on their farms so that there can be a lot of sharing of ideas and learning from each other. And um, in the, the summer months where you know, people are mostly pretty busy in the field, uh, we also become busy in the field and we have some on-farm research where we are uh, trying different termination methods for cover crop and planting three different vegetable crops into those. Um, we also have farmers in that community of practice who are trying their own um, new systems, um, sometimes trying things side by side with reduced tillage to see how that works out for them. And um, we are working with those farmers to help them collect some information about those different systems and in you know, a very straightforward way, um, whether those systems are performing better or worse than their old systems along a number of different metrics like weed management and yield and soil condition. So we're hoping that um, over the, the years we'll be able to develop those, um, those independent trials into some case studies we can share more broadly so that um, that community of practice can have a wider impact. Um, so today uh, we're out of one of the firms where uh, we, Claire, um, myself and Dylan, um, who is the other researcher in this project, where we've set up a trial where we're comparing different termination systems for vegetable production. Um, Claire, do you want to talk about the farm where we are? Yeah, and I quickly just say that we're at High Meadow Farm, which is in Johnson Creek, Wisconsin, and the farmers here are Mike, May, and and they've been farming here for quite some time. They, I actually don't remember the number of acres they have. I want to say it's around 10. They have a diversified vegetable farm, all certified organic, and they serve all direct markets primarily. And my mom is someone who's part of the coalition, which is how I originally met. And, and he hosted one other on-farm trial here at High Meadow was focused on living aisles. And so some of that work from that previous on-farm trial is what led to trial today. So Mike couldn't be here because he's having a problem with his aviation system. None of you will be surprised to hear that is taking priority over coming to say hello. So that's the, that's the brief introduction. All right, so um, you, oh, it's, I it is blown here that there was a, a helicopter behind us and we were talking and suddenly there's no helicopter and it's really lovely. So should I talk about the aisles and the yeah. cover crops? Why don't you do that? Right. So I'm gonna um I'm gonna just talk to you for a minute, but then we're gonna take the camera off the tripod in a little bit. I think you can see it's hard to see that my screen is so tiny, but you can see a little bit of what's happening behind me. So the way that um cover crop aisles and also cover crops in the planting strips in the fall of 2019. Then there was a year of COVID when we couldn't come out here and work on it. And so we, we had to do some reestablishment in the fall of 2020. But what I think you can almost see in the background there is uh, the living aisle is seeded with white clover and also perennial ryegrass. You can really see the clover right now. The ryegrass is not as evident. The aisles have been mowed a couple of times. And then in 
do you see the vegetables that was originally established with a mix of winter rye and hairy vetch so that the the idea there is that the vetch would be providing some nitrogen as as i'm sure most of you know nitrogen is an important nutrient, especially in reduced tillage systems or these no-till systems with um, cover crops in creating an in-situ mulch because that, the, that system uses a, more nitrogen and, makes, and there's less available for those vegetable crops that we planted into it. So having the hairy vetch in there is supposed to help that. But the main cover crop that we're working with is that winter rye, which we've killed in four different ways, terminated, I guess is the nice way to say that. We've terminated that rye with four different systems. And that's really what we're looking at in this trial is are those um, rye termination systems comparing them with each other with that living aisle in between. So those four treatments start with a control and that is what you would imagine. It was tilled with a rotavator on the back of a tractor and the living aisle that we established was also killed with that rotavator this spring when trials. We've got a video we'll show you in a second with some more detail about the, how we terminated the rye and vetch. So the first is the control, no aisle, standard tillage as you'd expect. The second is strip tillage and with that one the living aisle with the clover and the perennial rye is still in place but we took a tiller down the middle to create a 36 inch wide planting strip that was tilled with a walk behind. More like maybe 30. Is it 30? I think it's only 12. I'm going to put my foot on it. Oh, I don't, I think <laughs> we're having a little debate about how wide it is. I, it's, I think it's, I think it's 24. I think it grew in a little bit. Well, we didn't bring the map, <laughs> so, so we don't know exactly. It's between 24 and 36 inches. Um, we can answer that detailed question over email or when these results are, are published, you'll see all of that detail. Um, but that planting strip was tilled with a walk behind tiller. The, the third treatment was killed with silage plastic through occultation, which is where the sunlight is eliminated so that all the plants under that plastic are killed. And you'll see that in the, the video, how we did that. And then the fourth treatment was killed with a, a fabricated roller crimper designed to work behind a walk behind tractor. And the idea there is that, you know, I'm, I'm sure many of you have seen those, those large Chevron type roller crimpers for use with tractor systems. And we, went, we wanted to try a much smaller system with vegetables, one, because it reduces the cost, and two, because it's a much smaller area that vegetable farmers can work with on a, on a much more controlled and precise basis. So those are the four, treat, four treatments, control, standard, as you normally would think about it, a strip till with living aisles on either side, some uh, uh, the cover crop that was killed with silage plastic again with the living aisles on either side and then fourth is that roller is that roller crimped um, trial again with living aisles on each side into those four treatments we planted three vegetables it's a three-year trial so we chose the vegetables to be so that they could be rotated over those three years um, and we chose them from three different plant families because of that and we also chose vegetables that are commonly transplanted so that we would you know, have more success than we would have with something that was direct seeded. Um, so those three vegetables are first squash. In this case, we're growing a bush delicata. We, we chose a bush delicata because we wanted to minimize spread into those living aisles so that we could still mow those aisles as time went on. The second is a pepper, it's Carmen pepper and we are gonna harvest it red. So we want to, the reason we're choosing red is because it's a more valuable crop that way. And also because that will minimize the number of times we have to come out here to actually harvest the crop. And then the third is cabbage. It's storage number four and will be harvested um, later into the fall. Again, hopefully one harvest pass on that. So I think that that gives the, the overview. And now we're gonna show you a short video on how we terminated that rye, unless yeah. Rue wants to break it. Okay, we're in agreement, time for the video. <laughs> we established white clover and perennial rye aisles, alternating with winter rye and hairy vetch in the fall of 2020. In spring of 2021, 
We first mowed the clover aisles and then terminated the rye in preparation for planting two no-till and two tilled treatments. For the first no-till treatment, we terminated the rye using silage plastic. First, we knocked over the rye using a mower with the blades disengaged. Basically, we just ran over the rye to make it easier to do the next step, which was to really flatten the rye using a 50-gallon drum weighted with a cinder block. You can see how these two actions were very effective in aligning the rye and creating a mulch mat before terminating it with the silage plastic. The soil was quite dry when we applied the plastic, so we had to pound in the 8-inch sod staples after setting them by hand. Next, we prepared the strip-tilled treatment. We first mowed down the rye and then took two passes with a grillo walk-behind tiller for an initial kill. This is the second pass. You can see that the tiller did a pretty good job, but that some of the rye is still rooted and ready to regrow. These strips were tilled again right before planting. This is what the field looked like at the end of the day. The silage plastic is in place, the strip tilled and control plots have been mowed, and the strip tilled plots are also tilled. The standing rye is where we will come back the following week to roll or crimp the rye for the second no-till treatment. After we left the field, Mike came in and tilled the control strips with his tractor rotivator. This tillage worked up both the planting bed and the clover aisles, leaving the control fully tilled with no living aisle. This image is actually Mike doing a second pass on all the control strips on the same day that we did the roller crimping. You can see that though the tillage was effective, the control will need one more pass on planting day to work in the remaining residue. Finally, we crimped the last treatment. This crimper was designed by Ted Kornecki, who is an agricultural engineer with the USDA in Alabama. It was fabricated at UW-Madison. When the rye is at full anthesis, as it is here, the crimping action cuts off the flow of nutrients in the plant and kills it, leaving a mulch mat for no-till planting. This is what the field looked like right before planting. This is 21 days after the silage plastic was applied and nine days after crimping. The silage plastic treatment on the left terminated not only the rye and vetch, but also any plant material in the strip. The roller crimped treatment on the right killed the rye and vetch, but left some clover and other plants alive and growing. If the rye biomass in the crimped treatment had been greater, the mulch mat may have been able to smother those other plants as well. In this final image, you can see that the tilled treatment looks much as you would expect after the final tillage pass. Okay, so just as a final uh, note about how the trial is set up and then we'll go and have a look at the plants. Um, each uh, treatment was applied to an entire strip and the strips will get the same treatment year after year for the three years of the trial. Um, as I'm sure all of you know, if we're gonna see differences between treatments, those may start to appear uh, in the first year, but it's more likely that we will see differences and certainly more pronounced differences later on. So in each strip, we have the three vegetables planted um, <clears throat> in succession, and those vegetables will rotate through the strip as well. Uh, we have three replications, which is really nice because then if we see differences or when we see differences uh, in one treatment, we have um, two other replicates that we can look at um, and get an, an average to see what kind of trends we're seeing and also see what level of variability we might see between the treatments in different parts of the field. Um, so I think, oh, one other thing I wanted to say is that we, um, we had quite a bit of discussion about how we were managing these different systems, because I really, we have been trying to really think of them as different systems and they're systems where timing may need to be different um, in terms of, you know, for terminating the rye, for example, if you're using a roller crimper, there's a very specific timing with that to do that at Anthesis. And then we're also noticing differences that are not surprising in terms of the amount of nutrient available to the plants, uh, the plants in the um, 
treatments that have more of the rye residue left on the ground, the non-tilled treatments, um, are definitely, those plants are more uh, nutrient hungry. Um, and so we're seeing ways in which we have to manage these systems differently. And our approach in this year is um, mainly observational with some, um, some adjustments to the different needs of the crops in the different treatments. And in future years, we're hoping that we can, for example, front load those reduced tillage treatments with more nutrients um, so that we can achieve something closer to a um, closer to the performance of the conventional treatments. Okay, I'm going to hand over to Claire, who is going to talk about how we planted. All right, so then we're going to take the camera free and we're going to show you what's actually in the field. This is why we're here, is for this next part. But first I wanna talk through how we actually planted the vegetables into those four treatments. The control was planted as, as you would normally plant into a control, a tilled control. We did it by hand. And so we didn't use a water wheel transplant or anything like that, but we um, created a hole with a uh, walk with the, with the uh, wheel hoe furrower. We just created a line down the field, measured out all the plants are spaced at 18 inches and we put a compost, one pint of compost at every 18 inches, laid the plant in place, planted it, and then irrigated at the end. That is true of each of the treatments. We created a hole, we put compost in it, we put the plant in it, and then we irrigated um, after planting. The only difference is that in the two no-till treatments, so the one that was killed with silage plastic and the one that was killed with the roller crimper, we used an auger to dig the, to create a hole in that no-till treatment to put the plant into. This auger is, it was attached to a cordless drill. And the day that all, we planted on two different days and in the three, at the three different farms where the trial is hosted and the soil was very dry all three of those days. And so on some of the farms, we also had to go in beforehand and use a pointed and serrated tool called a hori hori, which is just a blade really, and actually poke a hole before we could even get this auger in under more, more under having, if we had more soil moisture, we wouldn't have needed to use the hori hori. In some situations, we even used only the hori hori because the, we, our, our drill ran out of power because we were out here for quite a while doing it. So this is the tool that created that hole for those no-till treatments. And now, we're going to take our camera off here. I'm going to switch you around and we're going to go see what the field looks like. And Rue, if you want to do the, uh oh, did we lose you? So I have sound, but I don't have video. There All we go. Right. Oh, oh, there it's back. Okay. Perfect. So if you want to carry that too, great. Do you want to? So we're we'll just give you a quick. I'll give you a quick overview. Our shadows are going to be in the way here, but where we're positioned, we can see each of the treatments. Um, we've got this one over here on the left. You can see my shadow too. Sorry about that. This is the cabbage, obviously. This is the strip till. So living aisles on both sides with the strip till with the um, wall behind BCS. And then there, just past that is cabbage. You may be able to see the peppers after that. You may not. Oh, I'm sorry. It's cabbage, squash, the peppers. And then is the control. So you can see the strip is much wider because we killed the aisle on each side of the, of the cabbage, on each side of the, the control. And again, the squash and peppers following that. And then as we move to the right in the field, this one has, this is where we use the silage plastic to kill the rye. Um, you can see the rye in place there. Um, Rue is moving that around a little bit. Let me move in so you can see what that looks like. There, this has been weeded a couple of times by hand, just by hand pulling. You can also see that this is not the amount of rye that we wanted to have as residue to create a season long mulch. We wanted to have more biomass here to really prevent some of those weeds that you're seeing there. 
And then finally, we have the last treatment, which was the one that you saw being killed with the roller crimper. And we're just gonna uncover, uncover this. You can see that the silage, plas I'm sorry, that there's landscape fabric in place because the, when the roller crimper went through, it only killed the rye and the vetch. It did not kill other weeds that were in place there. We didn't expect it to kill those weeds and it turned out that it didn't, which meant that the weed pressure in here is, is fairly strong. And so we put the, we put the um, what is it called? Landscape. The landscape fabric in place so that we could kill the weeds that were coming at the, through the roller crimp treatment. So another point about um, the roller crimper treatment, um, at, at all of the sites, or at least at, in all of the strips at this site and in all of the strips at a second site, we had a much um, thinner stand of ride than we were hoping for. Um, we had seeded at 180 pounds per acre, which um, in theory should have given us a much stronger stand. But when we measured the biomass that we had in the field, it, um, in this particular strip, it was about 6,000 pounds per acre, um, which is a bit lower than the 8,000 to 10,000 pounds per acre that is recommended for, um, for getting a good enough mat of killed rye that it's going to have good weed suppression impacts. So we were a little bit low here. There are other places in the field where we were considerably lower. And I think our average overall here was, um, yeah, 5,500 pounds of rye biomass per acre. So really, I mean, almost half what we would, what we would hope for. So after a couple of weeks of doing a lot of weeding in this section, we decided to, um, to put down the landscape fabric. And at that time we started thinking about how we can approach this trial uh, as a way of forming a decision tree of um, what you do when the unexpected happens, when, um, when you don't get that really great rice stand that you were hoping for. And so at this location, we decided to put down landscape fabric. At a second location, we, um, transferred additional rye mulch into uh, both the silage plastic and the roller crimper treatment. And at the final location, we put down silage plastic along the edges of the roller crimper treatment. Um, this is, even though this is a research trial, um, things don't always go according to plan. And um, we felt that we knew what would happen if we didn't um, do anything in this case, we would simply get a lot of weeds and a pretty poor, uh, a pretty poor performance of the crop. So we decided to um, try something different, see what we learned. Okay. All right. Hey, hey also Rue, and, Rue and Claire, sorry, before you move on, we did have one question in the chat um, that's from a few minutes back um, regarding um, strip width, it said, what do you consider the strip width that would make this a living mulch versus a living aisle or vice versa? Hmm. We were, tr we were not trying to do a living mulch. We were really trying to keep it in the aisle because previous work here at High Meadow, in fact, showed that having, having clover right under the crop as a mulch really inhibited yield. So we are, we were restricting it to the aisles and like I said, I mean, I think Dylan is on this call, so he might be able to look it up and type it into the chat. I, it's, I believe it's 30 to 36 inches. That is, I, and perhaps it is 30. That is the the strip, um, that we're planting into. Oh, you mean the width of our production bed? The width of our production bed is 36 inches. Is 36 inches? Great. Width of the production bed, 36 inches. Yeah, Do we want to take a quick look? I, I feel like we want to see, and you can already see it out here, like what the differences are in these. We've looked at the weeds, but you can also see pretty clearly, like sadly for all of us, that the, that the control and the strip till are doing way better. <laughs> like there's a visible difference in the health of these cabbage plants. That's, that is less true. I'm going to try to, I'll move down the field and try to focus a little bit more on the squash 
it's a little less true in the squash. Like the control is definitely bigger and stronger right there than it than the um, than the strip till on the left. And then with the with the with a silage plastic and the roller crimp over here, um, it's it's pretty. It looks fairly interesting, right? The 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 silage plastic is a little bit more yellow, but also a little larger. Whereas here with the roller crimp now being covered with that landscape fabric mulch, like they're greener, but also a little bit smaller. And we don't know like how that's certainly that landscape fabric is impacting that trial as well. It's not just the difference in the tillage. Did you want to add anything to that, Rue? Yeah, so um, about a week ago, we took samples, um, leaf samples from the squash and peppers and sent those in for nutrient analysis. And we also took soil samples at the same time. We had taken soil samples last fall, but um, we took another set to be paired up with the tissue samples. And I literally got the results from that um, 10 minutes before Claire picked me up to come out. Um, and I had a, a very quick look. Um, so we're going to be, what I, what I could immediately see is that for a lot of the plants in the, um, the reduced tillage treatments, they do have lower nutrient levels uh, for NPK um, and actually uh, sulfur, sulfur was high for some reason. Um, if anyone has insight into that, let me know. Um, um, so we'll be using that to apply some side dressing out here and we'll be using the results to tailor our side dressing so that the treatments that need more will get more um, fertility amendments. And then next year, we will be using that, as I said earlier, to front load our fertility program so that hopefully we can set these plants up um, to have a good start. Because I think there's just, we, we can certainly get them going better, but there's a point in the season, as you all know, where there's like, you're not going to rescue a crop back to its highest potential. But this is a learning year and we're certainly learning. Yeah. Yeah. Jacqueline, I think we're, are there any questions pertaining to what this field looks like? Cause we can take the camera through and look at anything else, but otherwise we'll put it back on the tripod. And we're, I think at that point, of questions. Ruth's got some more information about labor data that we can share, um, but is there anything that people want to see in the field before we go back to that tripod? I'm not seeing any questions coming up around about that, but we have, oh, about two dozen participants here, and so if anybody has any questions about what else is going on in this field or any of the other treatments, please do pop them in the chat. Um, I will add that Dylan, Bruce, who is um, who works with Rue and Claire and is also um, our presenter for next week, shared that the planting, planting bed target width was 36 inches in theory, but the strip till width was 30 inches because that was the width of the tiller. All right, great. Thanks, Thank Dylan. You. We're just, I feel bad about my shadow here, but we're just walking down the field a little bit so that you can see some of these differences. Hopefully we're going slow enough and not giving anybody car sickness, field sickness, zoom no, sickness. It's, your shadows, I don't think that your shadows really interfering with what we're seeing. So thank you for thinking about that. But I think I think we're in good shape. And I do have one comment here. Um, and someone's really just interested in tracking your research. It says, what's the best way for interested farmers to keep in touch with this research over the next three years? We do have a website, which is on cover crop based reduced tillage for organic vegetables, C-R-O-V-P is what we call it. And um, if anybody, we're ha we, can, we can't do that from the field. We are not on a computer, we're on a phone. <laughs> and so it feels hard to, to send that out right now through the chat. Actually, you know what, Dylan is probably on a computer. If Dylan, if you're on a computer, can you just pop that website in the chat? And then that you'll see all the information about the project on that website, including some photos, a way to be connected and join the community of practice, find out other events that we're having related to this trial. And then we'd also, um, we have a listserv that you're also welcome to join and you can send an email to any, any of us, Rue, myself, Claire or Dylan, and we can get you on that listserv. 
All right, I'm gonna turn around, which is gonna put the sun in your eyes a little bit. And we're gonna get back to that tripod and we're ready for questions. Yeah, we got those links in the chat for you, oh, um, perfect. Claire. So we're in good shape there. All right. Um, and Dylan did go ahead and pop in the chat that you can join the Climate Resilient Organic Vegetable Production Group by emailing CROVP plus subscribe at googlegroups.com. So just for Thank anybody who can't see the chat for right now. Oh, and there's another link. Okay, great. Thank you. Oh, did, can you see our farm truck there too? That little Prius C hauls a lot of stuff. Oh, I was gonna say, I wonder, like, what is that? That's funny. <laughs> That's that's the that's the farm. Well, it's not really the farm. That's like my car that gets used as a farm truck. That's sometimes how those I, things go. Sometimes I forget that it's a car and I, and I say, honey, I got to go load the truck. All right, we're turning you around back to us, I think. There we are. And we're going to get this camera set back up. All right, we're ready for questions. Okay. Um, let's see, I am looking for questions from our crowd here because I want to make sure that we are addressing whatever questions people have. Um, let me see, I'm going to go ahead and look into, um, maybe you can start out with telling us, um, Let's see when um, can you can you run through really quickly and maybe you did this, but like sort of highlight again, like what was your timeline through the planting season for when you did what practice? Because I know one of the reasons that you made the video for us earlier is because obviously that's not what you're doing this time of year. So what are you doing? Like what, what's your seasonal timeline look like and what comes next for the rest of the season? Sure. So the video did included um, some dates, which I'm going to try to remember, but we can also put a link to the video on the website if that helps people. Um, actually, I'm going to turn it over to Ruth. Sounds like, like, <laughs> you, like Ruth has some dates. <laughs> All right. So, um, so going kind of retrospectively, we were seeding the rye. Um, we seeded the rye a little later than we want, would have wanted to actually. We seeded that in um, in mid-September and hopefully this year we can seed it more in early September. Dylan may want to chime in on that as well um, in terms of like getting it in earlier so we get a really good amount of fire mass. Um, and so then we came in uh, at the end of June to mow down the rye for our tillage treatments and did an initial tillage on those uh, on June 25th, um, just to, to kill that cover crop in the planting strips. And we put the silage plastic down at the same time, uh, June 25, and kept that down through uh, the middle of June. Um, and then the crimping, you want to crimp at Anthesis. We were a little bit after Anthesis um, on June the 8th this year. No, June. We crimped the, the rye on June 8th. And then we planted the peppers and squash um, June 17th. So you're looking at me with great concern. Because I have different dates in the video. <laughs> okay. So. <laughs> and and uh, we planted the cabbage uh, July 6. Oh, Claire might have used dates for different sites. So our dates are often off by like a day or two because we have three different farms um, that we go to. So I'm using the dates for here. Yeah. For, for what it's worth, Dylan is confirming the June 8th crimping. Okay, glad to hear it. <laughs> um, so, yeah, the, the rest of the season, we should be starting harvesting peppers, I would think in another week or two, we're going to wait for them to be red. So um, we'll be harvesting them at full red. Um, and then I think we are gonna harvest the squash in September and the cabbage in October. Is that your I think memory? Definitely cabbage in October. I think the that we're using a delicata squash, so it could actually be ready probably in late August, even. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, which of course brings up a problem if we're still have harvesting the cabbage in uh, October, how are we going to seed the, um, the new crop of rye in the planting beds at that point? And that's a problem. Of timing, yeah. Of timing. It'll, it'll mean the rye won't be as advanced. It might not get as good catch and it might not be as at quite the maturity that we want in the, in the spring. So probably researchers shouldn't argue in front of, of other people, but- But we do all the time. But we do. It's not arguing, it's called discussing. So I'm going to discuss with Claire <laughs> the possibility that we should treat these systems as different systems and um, we could we could take advantage of the reduced tillage opportunity to overseed rye. Oh yeah, ah. into the cabbage. Into the cabbage. I love that. See, it's a discussion. <laughs> <laughs> so we will see. The picture of collaboration, you two. <laughs> at, the, at the same time that we do the other treatments, be, or sorry, that we do the other vegetables because those vegetables are already dead. Mm. Yeah, I love that idea. Yeah, there we go. See, reduced tillage gives you all this flexibility. Very good. Um, oh, if, if there are questions. Um, we have some very depressing labor data that we'd rather not share. So if there are questions, we can avoid that. But if not, we'll share the depressing labor data. <laughs> Let's hear the labor data. I think that's an important part of the picture here. <laughs> it definitely is. So I put together um, just a picture of um, for the different farms. I'm going to take up here. Um, looking at um, just the, the overview of how much labor has gone into this from um, late May when we got started um, up until uh, the end of the first week of July. So for the conventional tillage treatments here at High Meadow, um, each of those took about an hour total of, of person time, um, and that is calculated for 100 feet length of bed. That doesn't include mowing the aisles, that is just um, terminating the cover crop, prepping the beds, planting, and then any weeding that went up to the end of that first week of July. Uh, on the other hand, for the roller crimper and silage plastic, they have taken seven hours and nearly five hours respectively. So that's a really big jump. And the main reason for that um, we feel is um, in the case of the roller crimper, the fact that we chose to put down the landscape fabric mm. along the edge. And that's one of those things where I'm interested in, you know, formulating this decision tree where maybe I think another year, if we came out and did the roller crimping and we knew how low the biomass was, I would say, I don't want to go through two weeks of, of weeding this. Let's just put down landscape fabric on the sides right away. And so that would have reduced that labor. Putting down the landscape fabric certainly was a bit of work and time, but once it's down, it's down. Uh, with the silage plastic, it took us a while to put it down and take it up again. I think that's been the major labor for that. Um, and with the silage plastic, we saw that we had really good weed control for the first couple of weeks, and then the weeds start to poke through later in the season. So again, with that sort of decision tree mentality, there might be a point at which we say, you know, maybe the silage plastic needs to go on again along the sides to kill those weeds. Mm -hmm. um, or be down, yeah, or be down longer in the, in the spring, but then we risk we risk the mulch, the rye mulch decomposing more under that silage plastic. So there's a real trade off there. Yeah. Um, something that like I, I am saying to encourage myself is that this is the first year of this trial and um, we're hoping that we'll see changes in the system as we go along, even in these small strips um, where hopefully we can um, get a better soil tilth and we will be faster with planting. Um, I should say that a large part of this also was planting time uh, because let's see, it took us about three times as long, two to three times as long to plant into the reduced tillage treatments 
as it did the conventional till because we were using the drill and having to drill these holes. And as Claire said, the soil was extremely dry. So hopefully in future years when we have better soil structure, um, if there is also better moisture retention, it may be easier to plant into, mm. those, uh, into those kinds of treatments. Do you want to talk also about your theory around the auger creating oh. some compaction in that hole? Yeah, um, I think this may have been more of an issue at a, at a second farm site that has a clayier soil. But um, we, noticed in, we noticed a fairly high level of transplant failure at that uh, farm. And um, we also noticed that in some cases, even though we knew that we had, um, had settled the transplants in nicely into the soil, that they seemed to be popping back up a bit. And I'm wondering whether in a clay soil, the organ might actually be creating a little compaction zone so that you make this nice little hole, but the edges of it might be mm -hmm. compacted clay. Um, I certainly noticed for a few of those plants that the root balls had not really spread out um, into the surrounding soil very much. So um, again, we're, we're learning, it would be interesting to experiment with that a little bit but I think on a you know on an on-farm basis if that's a tool that you want to try um, maybe borrow one from a friend and um, especially if you have a clay uh, soil and just um, just pay attention to whether you think you're getting a little bit mm -hmm. of compaction in there. Another, an alternative too, which like I mentioned earlier, we tried when our battery ran out on the drill was to just use the Hori Hori to make that hole. And working together, Rue and I felt like that we were making good progress in the planting. We weren't taking, a, we weren't taking much additional time, but it is a different body position, right? Mm -hmm. So with that drill, you can stand up and press down on the auger and create that hole. And with the hori hori, you're bending over to get to create that that hole. I mean, you're always going to be bending over for planting anyway, but um, but that certainly was a difference. And I and with the hori hori, there's not that same concern about compaction. So if we do find that that is a that's an issue, that that would that would be one way potentially to address it. So it sounds like some of the um, some of the sort of challenges you're facing saying maybe have to do with like sort of like first year implementation and getting used to the system and then you would expect to see benefits of the system because of the practices over time and you'll just get better at doing the stuff like you'll you'll learn lessons as you go too so ideally um, that's the hope and the hope is also that yeah the, the soil will will change the soil structure through well, that'll be good to follow. And along those lines, there is a question in the chat. Will you be taking soil samples for each treatment area in the future? Yeah, so what we're mainly interested in is the changes in the soil physical properties. Because as I mentioned at the start, one of the things that we're interested in seeing is whether we can find methods that make um, that make production systems more resilient when we have these extreme weather events, whether it's drought or flood um, or something else. Um, and so the ability of the soil to infiltrate water quickly is a really important one that we wanna be looking at. And we'll be looking at that at the end of each season using rings to um, place in the soil and pouring a measured amount of water and timing the rate of water infiltration. Um, we also will be looking at, we'll be taking soil samples and looking at organic matter changes, but we don't expect that to change rapidly. That tends not to change rapidly um, in any case. And we also um, will be looking at the penetration resistance uh, of the soil. So um, I have a soil penetrometer here, um, which I can actually do a quick demo I do not know if we will see any differences let me um, turn around basically the camera, this is just a way of um of seeing how a penetrometer is is kind of um used to find compaction layers but also to find areas hang on you can kind of think of it as hey Claire um we, we lost your hang video on, there the is gone. okay there you go perfect uh, okay. I Thank you. 
so um Rue, I'm gonna back up a little all right there we go so right now I'm in a treatment um that had silage plastic and I'm trying not to stand right in it um but I'm just gonna press down and I'm watching the gauge and right now I am just coming up to 200 psi and then so that went up to 200 PSI and then down again. Do you want to do it again and I'll video? Sure. The pen, the... I mean, I'll, I'll try and pick a slightly different spot. You can see that there's a green zone, which is considered to be the area where roots don't get too much resistance to growth. And then if I go over and try this, in the conventional sewage, see what happens. So we're still in the green. So really pretty similar between these two treatments in this particular spot. Um, and so we'll use this tool alongside the um, the water infiltration um, and we'll sample multiple locations along each strip um, across different years and see if we see any trends in terms of um, how the soil structure changes and especially I think we're, we're interested in that ability of the soil to infiltrate water. We're also looking at soil temperature and moisture, we're collecting that data um, every time we come out here to see if we see differences um, in those characteristics. And there again, I'm, I think we're especially interested in whether in some treatments we get better moisture retention when we have the extended dry spell. Okay. Fabulous, that was, that was really cool. Thank you for sharing the um, penetrometer. That was really neat. Um, there is one more question that I think has been answered about what specific soil tests you'll be doing. And so I think you rolled right into that without any prompting. <laughs> Perfect. Um, I will say that you don't need a fancy soil penetrometer. Um, there's some videos out there. And um, if, you, if you just have, it helps to have a handle, but you can just have like a, a, a rod, a steel rod. Um, it's nice to have the gauge because you can see, you know, a little bit more, but if you've used it a lot, um, you can do a comparison to a fence row where you know that you don't have compaction and then go to your field and you'll get like that physical sense of how much compaction there is. Okay. Okay, well, um, I'm not seeing any more questions in the chat. Um, I have a couple of uh, quick things I was going to mention before from the PFIN before we close out, but um, do you have anything else you wanted to mention, Claire and Rue, before before we, I mean, any, anything else that you want to leave us with? Um, I would uh, just want to say I'm, I'm really grateful to people for coming. Um, if folks are interested in trying reduced tillage on their farm, uh, or if you're already trying some reduced tillage um, methods on your farm, we would love to hear from you um, and hear about how that's going. Um, so please join our um, listserv or come along to one of our events and talk to other people in the community of practice. Fabulous. Well, thank you so much. And it has been, you guys have been fabulous. This is wonderful information and it's really great to see what you have going on up there in Wisconsin. And it looks like it's a beautiful evening. So um, with much appreciation, we will, we will let you go. Um, for everybody else, um, let me switch back to my presentation here. Um, I was just gonna finally mention really quickly that we do have um, a series of, um, of events happening this summer. We have resumed um, some field days around the state. We have also um, opened up a lot of our catching up events that we have going on. So if anybody has um, the opportunity, please do check out our um, event listings on the PFI website. Um, we have events happening all over the state in all different areas of agriculture and 
Um, I am doing one tomorrow that I'm very excited about at Waterloo. We are meeting at Shaper Ridgeway's farm and it's going to be pretty fantastic. Um, he is going to be talking about how he has transitioned um, a few acres from row crops to vegetable production because it has been quite an adventure. So um, if you go to our website and um, that's what it looks, that picture on the left is what it looks like um, if you are at the top of the page and you, you scroll down to the bottom of the page, which you can see there on the right, it has a list of our upcoming events and you can click there and um, check out all of the things we have coming up. So please mark your calendars and check it out. Um, you can go there at practicalfarmers.org. All right, and with that, I'm going to go ahead and sign off. Thank you so much to all of our presenters and for all of your efforts in preparing for today. Thanks so much to everybody for joining us and um, so long from Practical Farmers of Iowa. <laughs>